However, in between, we can have multiple questions also on uh, on the way that people have been doing it, the right indication yeah. of doing it, the right way of doing it, the right uh, drug to be used, the right imaging modality we, to be we, used, the right yeah, we are medicine. Right. We are proceeding right from beginning. Yes. Hello. As to what we are going to use, how we are going to use, why we use it, when we don't use it, etc. Uh, also, I found during my workshops that a lot yes. of people don't have 3D clarity in anatomical aspects of injection. So right. I'm going to cover some part of that also. Right. But of course, uh, the actual technique, how exactly we process and proceed. Sajjud, I can't see my own face. Well, then I'll be able to... Now, now, sir, can you see? And, uh, yeah, I can see, but let me show me in gallery. Because I have so there's presentation. A, there's an option there called screen sharing. Down, green color button. Yeah, I've done that. You will have to open. Are you okay now? Can Sir, you see have you opened well? your PowerPoint? Have you have you opened your PPT? Yeah, yeah it's open. Yeah, now, yeah, we, are now, now, now we are able to. Now we are able to. Yeah, we are able to see that. How do I bring the people's videos on the top instead of uh, on the side? So on the top it may not go, on the bottom it may still come, sir. You can take it on the bottom, but you can no, actually it is, it is, you can just put a speaker view, sir. Yeah, I switched on the speaker view. Uh, that's it. I think I think that should be good enough. Or you can put a gallery view. You can do one of them, sir. Now, what is happening is this screen is covering part of my PPT screen. Press so, escape, sir. Press. We are able to see everything, uh, uh, the whole of your slide, sir. The whole of your slide is seen to everyone. Okay. But, yeah, but you can, sir. I'm it's covering the you people's videos are covering my slide. And let's I'm escape, sir. Here. Maybe you are on the full screen mode. Let's escape. Uh, no, sir. This is Neeraj here, sir. On the where you see all the speakers, na, upar aapko ek minus ka option milega ek. Once you press on that minus option, na, then that will that uh, your uh, the speakers will go away. Wherever you are seeing all the speakers yeah. on your laptop, where all the videos are showing you, there are minus questions. No, the question, the question pushing, we will talk about it. If I get their video, which I got yesterday, sir, sir, you will see it. You will see it automatically when they will talk. You will be able to see. Okay. Just keep it on one video. Like you, right now, you should be only able to see your video. That's it. Uh, I can't even see my video. So, minus ko se hai. Uske baju mein there are okay. two three options. Uh, okay. May, now I can see only myself. Yes. But I can't see my huh. Yeah. So if I'm talking, maybe you'll be able to I you I have put off my video, but if I'm talking, you'll be now see. Now can you see me? I am talking right now. Uh, not not yet. Sir, just press the speaker view ko speaker view ko change karke, gallery view kar do aap. But gallery view karenge to unka screen ja screen. Uh, but screen 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 screen. Screen. sir wants to see the face of person who who's speaking. 
So he is on full screen. Maybe if he should, you know. Exit full screen. Sir, दोनों नहीं आएगा. यहाँ तो आपका ढकेगा. यहाँ तो ये ऐसा होगा. हाँ, बिल्कुल. Your presentation will be covered by the speakers if you want to see their view. Uh huh. Because if I go smaller, uh, still it goes off. Okay. Let let me get on this. Then we'll see. We'll play it by ear then. Uh, we would request everyone to put their mics on mute so that sir can yes. talk. Sai, do that. that. Dr. Prabhu, Dr. Chobe, their max can remain on because they may be interjecting me on the way and add, keep adding things. So keep their with, uh, audios and videos both on. So if they raise their hand, I'll be able to see them. so we are we are still 5 minutes to go uh, let let us start sharp at 5 like keeping into the time slots we we always start from 4:45 onwards allowing people to join in till 5 o'clock and we are still 5 minutes in the session to start while the audio visual things can get set up and even before we can set up i think i, I would like to thank upon dr ashok sham who has been helping to relay this webinar through various modes uh, to to social platforms thank you ashok for doing it for bombay spine society we are really humbled and obliged with your efforts to do this neeraj neeraj is the backbone of the whole audio visual thing neeraj bijlani please accept our gratitude for you for yourself i mean you've really been the backbone of all the audio visual work that not only bombay spine society or bombay orthopedic society but i'm sure many many more orthopedic societies and non orthopedic societies across the country have been taking advantage of your skills the technical and the non technical skills both really really appreciate your efforts into this and dr sai jot raut who holds the zoom platform is the one who started this webinar thank you sai for holding this uh, let me now introduce the panelist for the day uh, we are going to start in 5 minutes from now we are going to have a big time session today we have dr vt ingal halikar who is the god of spinal injections at least in this part of the world and dr bharat chobe and dr prabhu i think for the longest period of time time i think more than his kids dr ingalalika kids pv prabhu and dr bharat chobe have been with him around him and helping him out and giving him a hand so i think the only two people who can probably if not replace but supplement and give another name to ingalalika sides dr prabhu and dr bharat chobe welcome dr chobe dr prabhu we also have dr kumar with us who's uh, who's a consultant at reliance ambani hospital andheri he also has a humongous volumes and publications in spinal injection techniques we have dr priyank patel joining us we have dr amit sharma from mumbai again and then we have our nationwide panel of uh, experts dr vasawda dr guru raj from delhi dr neeraj from ahmedabad dr umesh rikantam and dr ranjit unnikrishnan also apart from this few more members of bombay spine society are there the format of the presentation uh, or the webinar is very very same like it has been for last few days we will start with a introduction followed by a talk on technique and decision may i request all of all the all the members to please just go on silent mode and mute mode it's a means disturbance and distraction for the speaker so we will we will have the talk the overview of this talk is we are going to talk about different types of injections in lumbosacral spine different indications of various indications which injection technique to use in which condition tips and tricks and of the technique of various injection modalities we all know about lumbar injection techniques being facet injection epidural transforaminal cordal 
root injections versus uh, and then we all know various indications failed back to radiculitis to low back pain dr ingal alikar will highlight us about this our panelists will give him a hand on this we are also going to talk about various drug combinations the right drug combo which works the most we will be talking about this we will talk about the problems and complications that can happen if something goes wrong how to pick them up how to preempt them and what to do if something of that sort happens mind you uh, spinal injections are not a no complication treatment they have their own set of problems we are going to share some articles following which we will have a summary statement by dr ingal alika and then following we will have question answer round by delegates our talk is supposed to last from 30 to 45 minutes delegates are supposed to be on mute mode till the talk is over however in between if there is a burning question they can put it on chat mode dr prabhu dr bharat chobe dr abhijit will take up these questions on chat when keel reply if there is any specific question we will note that down and the, if there is any question that is unanswered we will note that down and we'll ask it during the question answer session relevant articles and recommended readings will be shared on this platform and also on the whatsapp will be forwarded across we will request all the guys to get connected to one of the faculty members through phone if you need any other supplement or any article or any journal reading support the questions will be taken only from 5 to 7 we will not be entertaining any questions after 7 o'clock however the number and email id of all the panelists including dr vt ingalika will be shared on this platform and you all can get in touch with them on their private and personal platform we hope you will have a wonderful time here with the stalwarts of injection techniques which is one of the most commonest thing which we all orthopedicians are going to be using more and more often but believe me every procedure has its own way out and every procedure makes a sense only when done properly in a properly selected patient please don't become surgical terrorists what dr engel alikar often calls it that just because you attended a webinar you are not right us to do this procedure in unindicated patients and so do the right way learn the right things learn the right technique and do it in right patients choose them well dr engel alikar over to you uh, may i request only the panelists to be on unmute mode and all the delegates to please put their videos off and be on mute post questions only on chat group dr engel alikar Welcome, sir. Welcome, all the panelists. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vishal. Um, right at the beginning, let me thank you all, Thansan, uh, for uh, organizing this. Uh, in the recent uh, APSS event that we had, there was a large response from the people for the injection workshops, and uh, though we had covered almost everything, there still new questions keep coming in from people's mind. and all these workshops are basically based on basically they they have a syllabus based on people's queries so that's how the workshops kept on going so let me begin with this okay now people always ask us ki when when was this thing done in the first time so 1901 april injection cocaine was being used earlier uh, and so many other things 1934 mr bar He, he propounded the mechanical root deformation by the herniated disc. Uh, again, further that during that period, around that period, uh, a lot of people were using cocaine or similar drugs in the spinal injections. But the epidural per se was not established by that time. Nineteen um, fifty was a turning point when a complex inflammatory cascade was described for epidural pain. Uh, of all the people. Uh, amongst all the people kirkaldi willis had a lot of work in this and he said it is not necessary for the mechanical compression uh, but the inflammatory reaction which is going to cause radicular pain and therefore that is where it was it was kind of a take off point from where the spinal epidural steroid injections became very very popular 1971 macnab had started selective nerve root block because by that time they had been able to acquire cms very very primitive cms till that time it was not possible for people to go uh, i have been using this technique since 1984 84 i had been out on a study tour and i spent time with various people and almost all those people like for example 
um, in Cleveland, the people, uh, Professor Mushin in Liverpool, uh, Professor Raj in Cincinnati, all these people, they had started, just started injection setups. Or uh, were about to start up, you may want to come little nearer to the mic, the, so as to make your voice a little more clear and uh, louder. Okay. Uh, so that, that is where the, I, I developed real interest. Till that time, uh, in Bombay, except anesthetist is giving some spinal blocks, um, nothing particular was being done for spinal injection. Definitely nothing was being done for injection. And once I got a hang of it, I realized that this is something good. But then, subsequently, I attended Kempin's workshop on transforaminal discectomy. This was way back in 1987. That is where I really truly understood the anatomical aspects of uh, transforaminal approach. And then further on, we developed it on. Okay. Uh, the basic philosophy one has to realize that when treating back and neck pain per se, I'm not talking about listesis as a structural deformation. I'm talking about the pain of the listesis. So when treating a back and neck pain, one has to be a physician first and only sometimes a surgeon as and when required. Uh, you will also agree with me that all of us put together, we all treat more than 80% of cases of back and neck pain non-surgically. The point is, what do we all have in our armamentarium? And since we don't know exactly what we're doing, we give analgesics, anti flams we give steroids, we give and so on and so forth. And very often, all this is directed, coaxed or prompted by the various pharma companies which come out with newer drugs and tell us to do so and so. Therefore, I've used the word here that irrespective of how clever we are, irrespective of whatever knowledge we have, we still treat these many patients empirically. And you'll agree with me that uh, every now and then some person gives a lecture or a talk on something, and then his regime is comes out as a swab all over and starts me. So we were and are still treating a lot of these patients empirically. Uh, chronic back neck pain treatment, all of you are aware, the tree outcome is often unsatisfactory. Uh, sometimes there's nothing surgical that you can offer, but there's something, nothing that you can really truly do for these people, and they are very often unhappy with you jumping from person to person. The most important cause of all this is our inability to localize the pain so saturated not necessarily by injection, even non-injection. The pain source is only a speculated pain source and not a confirmed one. So we fail to recognize the pain source. We also fail to recognize or sort of keep in our mind that the pain source itself could be multifactorial and it should be multi-segmental or multi-anatomical points. So you have the most common thing is discogenic pain, Next common is facetogenic pain, and next is a radicular pain. Many of you may not be aware of the fact that the root sleeve for about a centimeter or so, when it exists from the dura, has a sensory nerve supply. Apart from the contained root within, which will have its own neurological function of sensory motor for peripheral areas, the root sleeve itself has a peripheral nerve supply as a local segmental supply. And if the nerve root is inflamed, you get a pain which is arising from the neurilemma of the nerve root sheath or epidural sleeve itself. So you will have pains arising from those areas also. And you, of course, will have combinations of all these variety of phase. All in all put together, pain source could be single, could be multiple, and we'll have to look. We always uh, say that this so-and-so area is painful. This is a source of pain here. Or we say this bulge is a source of pain here. But is that true? Is every abnormal area, abnormal looking area, source of pain? And always the source of pain? No. If it completely correlates, I've seen very often uh, our correlations are more or less pacifying ourselves 
yes, 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 that is the source of pain. But does it really correlate with the patient's pain experience? Or whether some irritative lesions, which may be chemical or immunological, we may not be able to show them in any way, anywhere, by any imaging or investigation modality. They are not identified on imaging. The problem is we continue to treat empirically. And if you want to make something better, every attempt must be made to localize the pain source. And that is where we have to think again further. Now, the pain source that we normally call as a pain source, according to me, is generally is a speculated pain source and not truly confirmed. So any speculated pain source remains as a probable source till it proved otherwise. And one should not consider it as a confirmed unless the patient gets relief of pain after blocking that particular suspected anatomical spot or pathological spot. If you are able to do that, and if the patient says, yes, I am definitely better, then your speculation gets converted into a confirmation. So that is something one need to think about. Okay. So spinal injection modality, normally we treat it only as a treatment modality. No, please look at it primarily as a diagnostic modality and also as a treatment modality. It's a minimally invasive procedure, which helps us to localize the pain source. There are ways of finding out contribution of each source, how much it is contributing. And then you can have some solution to the diagnostic dilemma. And then of course, you can treatment done further. People always ask, how specific are these things? Well, as far as nerve root blocks are concerned, the diagnostic sensitivity is 100% in PID, or in about 85 to 90% uh, in foraminal stenosis. So these are two papers available. Mm. You select the procedure as for what exactly you aim to do. Like you pick up an instrument from the trolley, depending upon what you need to do exactly inside at a particular moment. So that's how you select the procedure, uh, predominantly based on clinical judgment, supported by the general investigation modality, and further on. Um, Many people give injections, lots of people give injections, and there are many reports even in the literature, the results are not so good. One of the reasons which we have found so often happening is the injection per se is not given correctly, not given accurately, and that is when it fails. And if it fails, the result is failed. Therefore, the modality of injection is always given an adjective that it's, it doesn't work. Well, that's not true. You must strive for accuracy and, there, and you must also strive for safety. And I would advise that you use image intensifier control. You must learn proper position of the CRM. At least right in the beginning or first few months or year or two, you must use radiographic contrast to confirm the location and for the prevention of intravascular injection. When you do this, you will find that there is accuracy, not only increase, but you have much higher concentration of medication going in an acutely localized correct spot. Uh, Dr. Inkalalika, can I, can, I, can I come here? Yeah, sure. So, so there are Thank articles. You. Now, there, there are these two points that you have just mentioned of importance. I think for, us, for the sake of all delegates, use of image intensifier control, proper positioning, and I'm use of contrast. That. All three things have been debated in literature. And I'm sure there are plenty yeah. of guys who do it, number one, in different position. There are plenty of guys who do caudal injections or epidural injections without image intensifier. And I'm sure plenty of, among us here use these injections without contrast. Can you please talk about the right position that you use? Why I'm you use? Coming to, I, have, I, I have slides on that, Vishal. Yes. I'm coming to that. Okay. I, I'll I share some articles article on this meanwhile while you're coming on the... Yeah, yeah. I'm coming to that point exactly. Okay. 
So important thing is to try to see as, as much accuracy as you can. Okay. Uh, the problems come when you have inaccurate needle placement and your false negative result. The false negative result can be because you've gone elsewhere and injected. You also have to decide whether people get placebo response, which is considered by me as a true response. Please remember, in the modality of treatment, in the treatment of back pain, we give all sorts of treatment medications, injectables, uh, local applications, physiotherapy modalities, injections, etc. Every new modality will always have a tendency to give a placebo relief in the hospital. So whether this is a placebo effect as a true response, then there are people who bring their work up have done variable degree block with varying concentrations of local anesthetics. Um, sometimes we have used radioactive class, but scar, edema, may not allow you to have a proper visualization. Now, coming back to what I said earlier about inflammatory response, uh, this is something uh, commonly not discussed in our fora. And I, I, junior ones, I would like to make a point here. Uh, this central part is made of, made of notochord. And the body and remaining areas are from mesoderm. Around the fourth week of intrauterine life, the notochord starts segmentation and disc develops. By the time disc develops and the nucleus gets enclosed like eclair chocolate inside, um, the reticular endothelial system is not formed. It forms around fourth month or fifth month. In the fifth month, when the reticular endothelial system starts, this particular protein, it does not get introduced to it. So whenever it gets chance to come across it, like say after first rupture of a disc or herniation leakage of those proteins, body develops, immune, body develops immune response to it. You get fluorid antibodies locally and the nearby areas, including the root, get caught in that battlefield of immune response fight inflammation. So sometimes a disc will herniate give a bump, give a punch to the root and retreat, or may not be acutely physically compressing, but patient still has radical irritation going on with the nerve root is inflamed. And this inflammatory cascade was described by Kirkaldi uh, Willis way back following which a lot of things have changed. Now, to give you another uh, quote here, there's a Kaslich um, work 97, he took 200 patients, did micro discectomy under local anesthesia. Then, under the vision, he applied mechanic fo mechanical force to various tissues around the exposed disc. And the patient response to the stimulus was recorded. And he found that the retraction of uncompressed normal root produced pain only 9% of patients. The retraction of affected inflamed nerve root caused pain in 99% of patients. That means presence of inflammation is an extremely important point as far as radical pain inflammation is concerned. So he concluded that inflamed nerve root is necessary for a mechanical stress to cause the radical pain. You will find that a lot of stenosis patients have a very bad stenosis in the foramen. The root is really chinked up but there is no pain, there's only paresthesia. So this particular area, this whole area as you see here is an inflamed area. And after a few days, even when the disc shrinks, you will find the radicular pain and irritation continuing going on there. One of the important things uh, about radicular irritation when a student, when the root is inflamed, it will resolve over a period of time, either by your treatment or on its own. We normally believe in negative or minus side of root inflammation sequelae. We'll get hyposthesia, reduction in the sensories, and reduction in the motor by some weakness. What we don't recognize, what we normally don't realize, is the hyperexcitability component. Especially the dorsal root ganglion, post-inflammation goes through a phase 
and starts developing ectopic impulses, like ectopic impulses arising in motor cortex in epilepsy patients. And they start sending messages to the brain, irrespective of there's a pressure or not, and person keeps getting radicular pain. Now, this is something which has to be aborted if you don't want a radicular irritability to remain for. And therefore, I like to use this term. If the patient has intense radicular pain, 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 even by changing position, that pain goes down. In that case, it's an inflamed root, and one has to abort inflammation to avoid the minus effects and to avoid plus effects. Uh, we use local anesthetic. The details uh, I'll ask Dr. Chobe, Dr. Prabhu say. We, local anesthetic is used, corticosteroids are used, they desensitize the nociceptors, they suppress the inflammation, they also produce relief pain. Uh, some people use even pure analgesics. The details we'll find out from that. Okay. The steroids basically prevent adhesions and scarring. They facilitate the conduction. They will stabilize membrane potential. Now, this is something very important. There's a phenomenon called hypersensitization syndrome, especially belonging to the central nervous system up to the anterior and posterior horn cells. And if the membrane potentials are unstable, they are hyperexcited, then smallest of irritation, smallest of a stimulation will produce intense pain when it need not have caused that pain. So this particular thing is also important. They suppress the ectopic discharges and all of them put together will take care of pain, paresthesia and function. Patient will have pain relief during this period and these will accelerate pain relief and this particular thing will allow faster return to function. Um, long, excellent short-term relief over a period of six to 12 weeks. Long-term per beneficial one year was not too high. Efficacy of nerve root blocks was more pronounced in cases with discogenic nerve root compression as compared to the foraminal stenosis. Whatever it is, once you've tried and once you've given and the patient says they are better, the important point is that pain-free period must be utilized for a very, very aggressive rehabilitation. Now, regard this part of the story, lots of series have lots of different quotes, lots of different conclusions. Very often it happens that when we say, I have injected in six cases of acute PAD, all those six cases are different than each other. So in a true sense, all the variants are, can't be taken care of. Well, there are side effects. The steroids will mask the response to infection. Some people say they may delay healing. Uh, some people say they cause irritation. Uh, there, are, there have been cases where we have injected, patient not felt better, we needed to go down for surgery. We have found that uh, when you go in for surgery inside, very often the crystals of depometrol, if you use a crystal, crystalline, they hang around slowly there. And we have seen this for as long as one and a half to two months locally. But one thing is for sure, the local hypervascularity, which ordinarily one would get, is definitely decidedly, decidedly less than one would get that. Um, it, would it delay the healing process? I'm not sure, I'm not. We have done injections and following that people have ruptured. But I would not blame steroid because after the relief of pain, people have resumed very aggressive activities, etc. The follow-up period of the acute PID also has to be a very gradual uh, resumption of activities, which did not happen in most of these people, and they came with rupture. So the delay in healing process, I'm not sure exactly how it will spell out. Um, Dr. Abhijit, you found any such thing here? Abhijit? Yeah, yes, sir. Have you found any delay in healing after using injectables? Healing of what, sir? Say, say it again. Um, healing, wound healing or anything like that? Any problems no. with healing? Because you were injected earlier, your surgical scar takes to heal or something? No, not really, not really, sir. No, never. Dr. Prabhu, uh, in fact, in fact, in fact uh, for all the panelists, I would like to come in here. I would like to come in here and ask all the panelists here, uh, there is also a question right at this point from a delegate from Dubai. 
posing a question that there are not any steroids which are approved by FDA or any governing body for spinal injections. Which steroid do you use? Because all of them are used purely on personal exemption. Which steroid is the safest yeah. one? It is said that particulate materials are not good because of the obvious reason they can lead to thrombosis of vessels, particularly in cervical spine. In lumbar spine, which corticosteroid is the safest? That's question number one. Once you answer, so Dr. Prabhu, can you answer that? Which steroid do you use regularly? And Dr. Abhijit, can yeah. you take it from there? If you, if you go through uh, every literature, you they would say that any steroid, whether it is dipomedrol, it has not to be used in the epidural area. But over the last 40 years, we have been using epidural, both sacrococcygeal, transforaminal, under C arm, and we have found no such effect of steroid on the uh, the uh, crystalline action of the steroid on the root or on the dura. There was I think one it's a big statement, Dr. Prabhu. Let, Dr. Prabhu, let, it's me, a big let, let me yeah. let me come back. Let me come back. There were papers in the past by Paul Lin who showed that after open discectomy, open decompression. He used to keep gel foam soaked in dipomedrol over the inflamed nerve root to prevent post-operative adhesions. This is a paper way back by a neurosurgeon, Paul Lin, way back in 60s and 17s. And after surgery, he used to keep gel foam soaked dipomedrol over the cord, over the nerves to prevent adhesions. So from that, I think you, you have to take a bold step and go ahead and uh, uh, use this steroid. We usually use dipomedrol. Right. Neeraj, Neeraj, since you are there on top of screen, Neeraj, which steroid do you use? I, I hear Dr. Ranjit. Ranjit, I'll come back to you on, on your answer. On the I use Canacord. And sometimes Depomedrol too. You know, I know Depomedrol is a particulate metal. So, I mean, it is uh, uh, maybe, you know, I mean, endangering. But I think major, major portion, I use Canacord in major of our patients. Right. Ranjit, are you there? Ranjit? Yes. Yes. Manjit, you just mentioned that Priamcinolone and Canacord both are approved. Uh, pardon my pardon my ignorance, but I guess they are both approved by spine bodies, but FDA has not approved any of these steroids in spinal injections. No, it has uh, been clearly you can, you can look at the FDA side that these steroids uh, are used. Transonol is very much approved by FDA. You can just Google it. You will just I just saw the Google document. It's Google. <laughs> Google, 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 Google Yes, Vishal. Gururaj, Vishal. Gururaj. Yeah. Vishal, yeah. I, 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 Go ahead, Guruaj. Yeah, sir. Actually, we had a case where we uh, actually long back we injected a depomedrol and uh, uh, had a basically a paraplegia. Uh, in it was epidural, epidural, epidural steroid, yes. and uh, because of that, we had a huge literature search, and uh, as uh, Ranjit is mentioning. Triamcilone and Canacot are the two uh, steroids which are found to be safe. Basically, with Depomedrol, they say that it can embolize uh, micro arteries in the spinal cord and cause uh, basically vascular uh, problems. So, as Ranjit would is saying, he's right. With, uh, uh, would that not happen with everything that you inject? Triamcinolone is, is again a crystalline. It's a white color. It's, not a, it's a suspension. Sir, uh, the base, basically because of the uh, particle size of the Depomedrol and Triamcilone, the difference in that, they say that uh, this phenomenon is lesser with Triamcilone. So that is why Triamcilone is approved for spinal injections. Actually, I think I think we all okay. we all must Guru? take we all for the sake of delegates. I think I think we all must take a message from here, both from the panelists who are here, also from the literature. The very fact that literature has evidence of complications with the use of Depomedrol is a testimony that multiple centers have tried and tested Depomedrol and found that they have had a series of problems with Depomedrol, Michel. particularly in cervical spine. However, Dr. Prabhu, I'll come back to you. On, particularly in cervical spine, there are no such studies to mention any problems in lumbar spine related to Depomedrol. One of our panelists here have been using it for the last 40 years. And they swear by it. However, uh, from FDA point of view, Triamcinolone and Canacot are approved. Uh, and Cochrane database also mentions their use. However, approval, I will have to really check back before the end of this talk. We'll come back. Now, let me just put my second question to Dr. Ingalalika. Dr. Ingalalika, you just mentioned about delayed wound healing after these injections. Uh, no, my it question does not is. Happen. No. Yeah, it doesn't happen. My, my question is say, for, for example, if a root block doesn't work, for example, a patient with large PIVD. Uh, with radiculopathy, you give a transforminal root block 
and the patient symptoms don't get better do you keep a duration do you keep a duration before you jump into surgery like 3 weeks 3 months 6 months before you really ask oh, for a surgery we, for we the same worry don't that operate that the injection is given oh, lately the infection of wound healing are going to happen no we generally don't operate before 6 weeks because we have got to allow the dipomidrol to work for a while it doesn't work overnight uh in couple of cases with a very very bad acute uh, situation we have given solumedrol in locally in the epidural space that also has helped but that disappears just in no time from there if you want right. the action to be given there right then you as well give it intravenous and look at them okay right uh, right dr Richard dr bharat said, dr bharat dubey you are there dr bharat chobe you are there yes neeraj while dr bharat comes we will uh, we'll want yeah, to have Vishal. you all. Yeah. Okay. You know, I, I, I would have a Hello? paper with me yes. now, but very recently I read one of the paper where you know they have studied the rate of infection uh, in a patients where a prior epidural block has been given and posted for microdiscectomy. So they found that you know any surgery done within three weeks of that injection, the infection rates were doubled. This is an American paper, you know, randomized RCT trial. You know, I, I was trying to get it. I was trying to get the paper, but couldn't get it. So, I mean, they recommend that after first block, if you want to operate, generally you should operate after three weeks, not before that. I think, I think message is clear. And, and for the six months delegate, like what Dr. Ingal Alikar said, you have to give at six least three to six weeks for the block to work. This question of when does it start action? It can start action from either day one. till 6 weeks and so you should wait at least for 6 weeks taking the neeraj point forward i have shared a article about does the timing of perioperative pre operative block may, makes a difference to infection rate yes there is a article uh, and which mentions that any surgery done before 3 months after the injection has a higher chance of developing infection if a fusion is done however there is no such uh, uh, thing about discectomy being done however wherever there is a fusion done after a root block injection which has not worked the chances of having infection are twice compared to when it is done after 3 months uh, dr bharat your quick word on that and then we'll allow dr vti to take it over from there for and proceed in the talk dr bharat can you hear us dr bharat chobe vishal i have one question for dr ingal halikar yes sir go ahead yeah dr I bharat you have to unmute have dr bharat to you have to unmute your speaker while we take up this question yeah, go ahead Proceed, sir, sir uh, with regards to cervical spine injections, do you think that dexamethasone is safer as compared to uh, dipamidrol because it is no, not a crystal? No, I'll tell you. Uh, we use cervical facet, not intraarticular, extraarticular, and we we very rarely go lateral to the facet to inject posterior ramus, but there also we have used dipamidrol. Uh, i'm coming to the concentration that we use you probably will understand why it doesn't work uh, doesn't give that much trouble um, maybe in a higher concentration it would certainly give it would probably give even faster relief maybe within two days patient will feel better but that's not the point point is to see that you have adequate medication but at the same time no excessive medication i would like to quote one study here the rather Um, uh, one particular findings here um, found over many thing manchi kanti and those people have done this they have injected these nerves by various concentrations of local anesthetic and they they have found that 0.5% solution will block only sympathetic fibers and nothing else 1% fibers will block sensory nerves and 2% will block all of them including motor so when you you have a ready mix whatever you mix and when you try to use it inside if your concentration is very high patient may develop motor deficit post injection immediately and that's a great cause of worry concern anxiety fight with doctors etc so you got to see that overall you are using something the mixture eventually should not become more than 1 percent of the total solution that you have installed there i think i think this i think I, i'll take this i'll take this opportunity to also bring out the controversy even more through a randomized control trial in one of the centers which is very very huge center and they have compared 
the the presence of it's a randomized double blinded placebo controlled trial which compares the use of lignocaine alone versus lignocaine with steroids and unfortunately they have come up with a word that the use of steroid do not add to any clinical improvement over lignocaine alone and lignocaine recommended is less than 1% in all these cases and this article i am sure everybody would want to read upon so dr ingal alikar uh, uh, we will we'll go back to you and your talk we are on the diagnostic blocks we will come up with further yeah. questions as the situation arise we are again with you okay. on your presentation Fine. all right okay so for a therapeutic block um that is we will we will use various mixtures uh, I, i i prefer this combination uh, dr chaubey dr prabhu have far more experience of injecting than i have and their words should be more uh, you can use methylprednisolone 80 mg in 2 ml that's the concentration you use whatever you want in acute severe pain we also use tramadol some people we have used 2% xylocaine and 0.5% bupivacaine which is by used by anesthetists and the volume will be as for the needed whether we need it need to inject 2 3 4 facets whether we need to only one transforaminal we need to go to multiple levels or whether we are going tra transcordal epidural depending on the situation you will have to make your combinations but combination is your own choice and this is something which i use dr bharat can you tell us what the combination you love to use dr bharat chobe dr prabhu can you tell us dr bharat you have to unmute your talk and then come on online bharat press up space bar on your laptop dr prabhu can you tell us dr prabhu yeah the this is the right combination but i would put one point here is try to use a, a local anesthetic agent which doesn't have a preservative and if you go through those bottles you will see that only 0.5% and 0.25% bupivacaine they don't have any preservative but 2% xylocaine does have so we would prefer lesser amount of xylocaine 2% and greater amount of 0.2 0.5 ultimately the whole mixture has a, a local anesthetic strength equivalent to 1% so i would prefer 0.5 because of the uh, absence of preservative in that uh, local anesthetic agent yeah abhi ji abhi in fact in fact in, in fact most of the most of the uh, co complications are related to the uh, preservative that is present in the local anesthetic i think dr bharat is here dr bharat uh, what what kind of xylo lignocaine do you use i mean do you use a cardio safe xylocaine or you use a, something like a preservative non preservative dr bharat chobe yeah there is a problem sorry abhijit you just the xylocaine yes abhijit yes why, sir why why any specific reason for that yeah because uh i feel that xylo uh, lignocaine plain lignocaine can cause allergic reaction so i'm always worried about that so i feel yeah, that xylocaine is safe hello okay let's let's proceed in the meanwhile uh, you yes dr ingal alikar please please proceed now once once you have understood this particular point that we are using this for taking care of inflammation yeah there is some problem you can some problem in this particular flaw for bleeding yeah can i yes can then you can formulate your indications one of the local pain local pain with referred pain or radicular pain radicular pain trigger spots and one of the absent indication accepted indication is absence of a progressive neurological deficit if somebody rapidly deteriorating don't inject you will need something more than that if you find that yesterday's pid patient yesterday and today has deteriorated that's not the point where you should go and inject unless he is unfit for surgery so or a cardiquina patient don't try to use this don't try to buy him of this don't do it uh we can use it for trigger spots which are secondary to uh, these happenings 
Contraindications are common for any injectables, uncontrolled diabetic infection system with local sensitivity, bleeding disorders and coagulants. We generally stop anticoagulants as per the guidance. Uh, aspirin may not be stopped, but we prefer to stop it for 24 hours at least. And those people who are on higher anticoagulants, we stop them for a week or, week or 10 days and then take them off. Uh, we had in the past two, two or three cases where there is intense uh, epidural hematoma post-injection. Um, apart from puncturing the vessel, the vessel did not stop bleeding because the patients had not stopped uh, their anticoagulants. And today, nowadays, we find lots of people are anticoagulants and one has to be very, very careful about these things. Like we said, okay. Now, technical complications could be dural puncture, sometimes bloody tap. If you have bloody tap, wait, don't leave it there. No rate injury, I have seen it happening twice. People have gone transferaminal and injected directly within the structure of the nerve root, within the neural sheath. And when the nerve expands due to a tension of fluid within, then patient has a bad pain, bad trouble, and even neurodeficit. One of the patients developed immediate foot drop and immediate intense pain. The foot drop was recovered over a period of four or five months, but the intense pain not only continued next day, it continued for nearly six weeks. Severe neurologic pain, irrespective of doing anything, irrespective of doing anything, everything. And then slowly, it, for a year or a year and a half, it sort of kept on going. This would have happened irrespective of whether the drug had prescribed you or not. I think expansion of the interstitial fibers is the cause of ischemic trouble. So one has to be careful about it. And of course, uh, durable related, those things will be always looked into. Uh, one has to take care, not going intradural. There are two places where you can go intradural. One is when you're going translaminar epidural. There are very, very high chance that you will get into that area. The second is if you are too interior or if you are too deep while going transforaminal. Transforaminal, once you touch the bone, we'll come to that discussion further. You have to just got to move about two millimeters, not five, six, eight millimeters. Then you will puncture the dura. And injecting the drug inside the dura is inviting trouble. So you have to be very careful about it. So, so Dr. Ingalika, I think Dr. Prabhu has a point here to make. Dr. Prabhu, please come in. Sure, yeah, sure. Vishal, uh, Vishal, I, I, as you said, uh, Vishal, as you said in the beginning, every procedure has its own uh, basket of complications. And I would like to bring in a very important point of caution here is that this procedure, whether it is therapeutic or uh, diagnostic, please, please, please do it in the operation theater with all due aseptic precautions. We have heard from the patients that this has been given in casualty side room, ward side room, OPD side room. Please, 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 please do it under strict aseptic precaution as if you are about to operate a, a disc. Please. I ahead. think this is the most valid point that we all delegates from here should take home. Please do not consider a root block in injection, injection, a daycare or a faltu procedure. It is not a faltu procedure. It has its due course. Please give respect to this procedure. This procedure has to be done under one, strict aseptic precautions, two, in operation theater, Three, it is known to create problems, problems as simple as mild infection, problems as big as bleeding, problems as big as, as it has been discussed in the chat group also, a motor palsy is known to happen in some cases when your dose is high, when a patient is sensitive, when your injection inadvertently goes into the dura, it can get converted into a high spinal, it can lead to a motor blockade, transient blindness has been reported, infections have been reported, intravascular leaks have been reported, cardiac events have been reported, and these patients have to be informed about this. Though the incidence of all these complications is as small as 1 to 3%, however, sometimes these can be disastrous and it may actually require a OT setup. Also, please inform all your patients that there is a risk of infection, there is a risk of all these problems that can happen. It is though minuscule, but it is there. 
and one thing that can really happen more often than what we think is a motor weakness post operatively though it is very very transient and patient will have complete recovery of motor power within 4 to 6 hours however it is absolutely important to inform your patient and like dr neeraj mentioned i think that you should counsel them that you may actually require to hospitalize them for a day or so and that is why opd procedures surely should not be done dr uh, neeraj uh, would you like to comment on that neeraj your voice yeah yeah so i think you know i mean uh, we have few uh, patients where actually you know i mean inadvertently the needle even went for a spinal while giving from transforaminal so uh, we injected initially dye and after dye was proper but somehow you know maybe needle movement it went into a dura and we gave a, a spinal anesthesia and patient almost had a total motor block and we had to admit that patient patient started getting recovery only after 6 7 hours so i mean if you have not explained right. this admission and everything that may be a scary situation so always be prepared yes. for such event and like doctor rare but yeah. it's very yes. important to explain yes thank you thank you neeraj for bringing it out i think a, a small tip that dr priyank patel dr priyank i saw you joining us dr priyank you were mentioning about a tip to prevent such problems and to mitigate the effect of this what is this short acting uh, 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 xylocaine can you please mention about it dr priyank patel are you there with us yeah <coughs> can you hear me yes we can can you please highlight about this short Hello. acting short acting xylocaine what is that thing we heard from abhijit about xylocard because it is cardio cardia protective uh, we would like to know about this yeah, short so, acting so that if a patient yeah. develops motor event he recovers from it fast please elaborate correct so correct so i personally have had this uh, experience where initially with bupvk which is a longer acting local anesthetic the patient has had a total motor block which stayed on for around 4 to 5 years 4 uh, to 5 hours how much ever we counsel the patient the problem is that if after a block a patient wakes up with a foot drop that really plays very bad with the psyche of the patient so these patients need to be adequately counseled that if there is a total motor block don't be scared because it is going to go away and in order to avoid this i always use lignocaine 2% without adrenaline so that it's a shorter acting anesthetic even if you get a total motor block it goes away within half an hour 45 minutes which is what is the ideal counseling to the patient that they need to be in the hospital for that long right now i think i think i'd like to come back to dr engelalika dr engelalika can you please tell us what size of needle do you use and also how do you ensure that, that on. on one hand you just mentioned no, about tip that Sir, sir, we have a specific question here. What needle do you use, and how do you ensure that there is no intravascular leak? We we just spoke about preventing leak into the spinal into the dural sac. We would also want to prevent the leak of these drugs into vessels. How do we ensure that? Your and Dr. Prabhu's word on that. How do we ensure that there is no intravascular leak? And Dr. Sandeep Sonone, I hope you are there. Dr. Sandeep Sonone is joining us. We will want to have your word also. You have had one experience like that. So, Dr. Engalalika. Yes. number one is you you can't be in hurry this this procedure requires a patience and time if you don't have any of these things patients or time don't do this process you got to be infinitely patient you can't say do minute mein khatam kar dunga usme kya hai no sometimes we at our level of experience take anything within 15 to 20 minutes or even longer for a case so don't be in hurry to if you are in hurry your needle doesn't stay in place the needle moves and the needle even 2 mm 3 mm movement can produce these kind of difficulties that is number one technically speaking it out but unless patient has a very large vessels which sometimes we see doing surgery unless to that kind of vessels the punctures are not too bad the the vessels are very tiny and injecting them perforating them good enough to produce a lot of bleeding is not that common so that is one thing uh if you try to aspirate which is what commonly is advised the vessel you have to be truly intraluminal to be able to see a blood coming into the syringe which doesn't happen so you really can't make out whether you're intravascular or not intravascular that's one thing but as i said if you use your dye for delineating you will know where exactly you're going the uh, vessel right. spray is a different 
volume agile. The needle which we use, we generally prefer to use 22 number long spinal needle, which is three and a half inch long. In obese people, this length of the needle is often not enough. We need to ask for extra long four inches, four and a half inches needles. I think Why? very, very important technical tip for all of us, 22 gauze needle, uh, use a longer one for fat patients, a shorter one for thin patients, but a 22 G needle, ensure that you don't go too deep inside, ensure that you're not giving an intraneural substance injection Ensure while aspirating that you're not giving it inside the dural sac and ensure that you're using a dye and always check it under CM guidance to see the spread of dye. If by any chance there is a spread of dye in the vessel, please do not inject in there. Uh, Dr. Dr. Prabhu, uh, can you tell us? Vishal, 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 just to complete that. Vishal, just yeah. to complete that. Yeah. If you use too thin a needle in order not to give pain to the patient, the needle may not be seen on your CM. If you use 23 number, 24, 25 to give the patient less pain, the needle will not be seen on the CR for a normal lumbar spine lateral exposure. So you right. need at least some substance and therefore 22. Uh, I could be even more comfortable with 21. Right. Uh, Dr. Neeraj just mentioned he uses urographin. Dr. Prabhu, what dye do you your team uses? The, you, at, at present, we don't use any dye because out of experience, we have been giving it for the last 40 years and uh, uh, usually you use Omnipec, water soluble. Omnipec. What ML, how much ML of dye do you use? That is more, uh, one to two, uh, two ML is more than sufficient to delineate a nerve. Right. Dr. Sandeep, Sandeep Sonone, uh, can you please unmute and come online, please? We would like to hear your experience. How do you do it? Do you use a dye? And how do you differentiate while the moment you inject a dye, how do you differentiate on a CM? What kind of spread is called a vascular spread and what kind of spread is called a neural spread? Yeah, so it, uh, what I usually do is that it depends on what area of the nerve root I want to give a uh, injection. And uh, as Dr. Prabhu mentioned, I do not usually uh, try to delineate the whole nerve root because if you are intravascular, and, uh, and if you try to delineate the whole nerve root, then probably you are, uh, you know, sort of injecting a bit more. What you have to imagine in your mind, which part of the nerve root you want to get and just delineate that border. For example, if I'm going in the shoulder, I would just like to delineate the lateral border of the nerve root and that's it. If I'm going in the axilla, maybe a sort of, you know, branching pattern of the nerve root where the medial border of the dura and the lateral margin, the medial aspect of the nerve root is what I want to utualize. If there is an intravascular... We shall into all those technicalities. Sorry, Michelle? sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come back, sir. We'll just finish this answer since it is raised right now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if there's an intravascular reek, so usually it's the epidural veins where it goes in and usually it gives a nice uh, sort of a longitudinal feel on the medial aspect of the pedicle. So that is where you should be aware of that the dye is going intravascular. So as right. Dr. Uh, Prabhu said, just one to cc, uh, two, two cc of dye is more than enough, don't try to delineate the whole nerve root. Right, right. May, at may this I also... point, Vishal, Vishal, at this point, let me tell you that you have to take all possible uh, exposure of the spine. You have to do it in oblique, see in lateral, see in AP, and then only then you will know the safety of the collection of the dye around the nerve. Don't only stick right. to one, one, one view. Yes, I think it's very important for all of us to understand that Please ensure that you have seen the spread of dye without using a dye. The chances of you having an intravascular leak of your drug is very high. And the chances of you having cardiotoxicity and bigger problems can happen, particularly in cervical spine. In lumbar spine also, drugs can easily leak intravascular. A lignocaine going into a vein or an artery is a disaster that can happen. And that's why please ensure that your dye, your, mus your, your drugs are not going neither in the dural sac and should not surely be going into any vessel. And this has to be done under CM. Rely upon a thin needle, rely upon a small amount of dye. Omnipec or urographin are both safe. Use a smaller volume, use a thick needle, localize it in the AP and lateral both. And only when you have seen a specific pattern of dye distribution, only then you should give an injection. Uh, before we go to Dr. Engel Alikar, may I have Dr. Brodzinski? Dr. Brodzinski from Dubai, he is a pioneer in injection techniques and conservative treatment. Dr. Brodzinski, can you come on online? You were mentioning about some nerve stimulation before you inject your drug. Dr. Brodzinski, are you there with us? Uh, Dr. Biggie Brodzinski? 
I think we don't have him here online with us right now. But we'll catch him on. He he has an opinion about stimulating the nerve before giving the medicine, and uh, we'll ask about his opinion on that. Doctor Engalalika, we are back to you for the radiation exposure part. H how and what to yeah. see while well, placement of needle, and how to ensure what kind of spread, etc. I'm not good radio, radiologic exposure. I'm good radio radiation exposure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, people are always worried about using Siam. Oh, come se come wapro. Don't use it much. Choru padega thay is wapro. Idhar tak gaya na abhi de do chalo. No. So that fear is not as uh, as bad as we all imagine. The average fluoroscopy time per procedure. There are various papers. This is just one paper. Average fluoroscopy time per is 12.55 seconds. That means 13 seconds cumulative foot pedal pressure time. The average cumulative exposure per procedure, the ring batch which we commonly use it where is 410 millirem. The glasses batch 247. Outside apron 398, and inside apron is 15 millirem. See the difference outside the. Apron and inside that. So therefore, don't ever do this procedure without a thing. The average procedure exposure during these procedures was sometimes even below the level of detectability. So the international guidelines have come thereafter that radiation to spinal intervention is was well within safety limits. When proper proper techniques were followed, and instead of using a continuous exposure, use intermittent exposure during procedure, every two seconds, three seconds, four seconds gap. As we advance the needle, keep looking at it rather than in a continuous flow. They also recommended that your body, after any exposure, recuperates immediately, starts recuperating immediately, whatever the effect of radiation. And they have advised that instead of doing these procedures daily, try to do them. Less frequently, and we we follow that to an extent. The doctor Chowbe, doctor Prabhu, of very often inject these patients on alternate day, and we try to see that we don't do it more than about three times a week, so that our body is have enough chance to do take care of the thing. Um, pulse mode, as we said, is much much better. The image quality in a low dose is adequate. We don't need it like a particular screw fixation or a technical um, procedure inside. We need to hold the needle. As soon as you reach the needle, then you can reduce the exposure dose. You can reduce the KV and proceed further because then also you will get enough of information as to what you are doing. So these are two things which can be followed. Now this is a general uh, thing. Okay. Now, uh, one more thing which we commonly do is we keep our hands off the beam using long handled instruments. We use uh, the swab holder in our hand as a handle with a ring. The ring because the localization can be better, and use long needle holder to hold that spinal needle. We shoot a pilot image, and after that we use auto exposure. And after we have done that, we reduce the exposure. Get on with the work. If at all you want to, you find the image is not good, don't increase the KV. Try to make changes in the monitor. The brightness contrast you can adjust all the new monitors. DG you can enhance the image there. And keep the exposure lesser than what your auto exposure will show. So this is something important. Use pulse and intermittent exposures. Uh, we shall ask how to use a CM properly. And if you don't know how to use your CM, your accuracy suffers. Not only that, you'll end up taking longer time, and you often give ineffective, inaccurate delivery of the medication. Uh, basically, people always ask in workshops, "What what image intensifier should I have?" I think, <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think, Doctor VTI's network has gone. So maybe we can have 
some questions here. We already have multiple questions happening around. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, the, the first yeah. and foremost question that is coming across, and also may I have Dr. Neeraj also on this question, is how, how laterally do you start from midline to get your injection placed in the right place? And what is that one landmark on the CRM that you check for? Uh, in uh, we that is what Dr. Ingalani Karu would have uh, come in the uh, uh, subsequent. I think he'll join us in a small while. Dr. Sai yeah. is helping to get him back. Meanwhile, yeah, we'll have the, some questions. Yeah, the, uh, you saw that uh, uh, finger grip of the uh, artery forcep or a needle holder that is to be placed at the spot where you have the target organ. If you have the facet, keep the CM in the oblique view. Keep your finger grip of the artery forcep on the facet, and facet is the most easiest because you don't come across any nerve roots uh, being uh, 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 in your pathway. But when you go for the uh, foraminal disc, you have your exiting nerve root coming out there, and hence you have two safe triangles there demarcated by the uh, exiting nerve root, become, which becomes what we call as a hypotenuse of that safe triangle. The above the nerve root, we usually go in for your uh, root block and below the nerve root, which is called as the Cambin strangle, that we go if you have to disc, uh, inject around the disc. That is the that say a disc uh, where you have the bulge. Right, right. I think I think uh, this, this, this Cambin this Cambin this Cambin strangle is usually used by the endoscopist to enter the disc. Uh, Vishal, Vishal? Post Vishal, I have a question. Michelle, yes, Amit, can I talk, Michelle? Yes, so, uh, my, the, the so, question is that, you know, like, uh, so how do we decide whether we are uh, injecting in the Cambin's triangle or uh, whether we are going to delineate the root and injecting over there? Over there. Dr. Neeraj. Yes, yes, Michelle. Will you take that question, please? Well, I guess, you know, Amit, uh, what I feel is uh, there are two, two things, you know, one, what is the purpose of your uh, injection? If you are trying to give a trans uh, foraminal epidural, then yes, you would want to be in a slightly into more into Cambin's triangle. But if you want to give a root block, you really don't need to be in exactly in the, in the Cambin's triangle. You can be even slight lateral to it and you can inject at the root block at the exiting root level. And uh, our, my landmark mm -hmm. most likely is, you know, as we do in a transforaminal endoscopy, that, you know, in AP view, I, I don't, you know, I mean, major, major, I don't see oblique views in most of the uh, my blocks. I mostly rely on our AP and standard lateral views. So in AP view, my trajectory would be, you know, when my needle is at lateral of the pedicle and in, uh, sorry, in AP view and lateral, just, you know, I mean, just above the disc space. So I mean, it is a classical trajectory for uh, needle insertion for our transforaminal endoscopy technique, you know, I mean, and that probably is more or less, we are sure that it is into Cambin's triangle. So my preference yeah. is Cambin's triangle for the simple reason that it will take care of both the exiting as well as traversing nerve root. Yes, I agree. So uh, that's what can I add a point? Why, 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 what is the purpose of your injection? If you want to give it epidural or you want to do a diagnostic or a therapeutic root block, you know, that basically, you know, that uh, that's where, you know. I think Priyank, Priyank has a model Michelle, already in hand. He's Michelle, the man with Michelle. arms. Yes. Can I get in there? Yeah. So, so yeah, Amit, we'll get the, the point that you Amit, asked. Back to you. Amit, I'll get back to you. Priyank, please, Priyank, what, yeah. you have a point to show. Uh, basically, yeah, we so want to know how to place the injection and at what place. Place the needle. Dr. Uh, uh, Prabhu, can you call upon Dr. Engel Alikar and help him to set up his again, please? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, Priyank, See, please so do technically, that. Technically, one broad guideline that we can use is uh, when we are uh, looking at a patient, the patient is lying uh, supine, and when we take an X-ray, the thing that is very easily visualized is your spinous process and your transverse process. So let's say if you take your, if your needle placement on the skin is beyond your transverse process, you will get an easy trajectory so that when you go deeper inside, your needle will directly go into the foraminal area. Let's say if you try to go a little medially, you'll have to struggle a lot to try and get into the foramen. So as marker broadly, if your entry is beyond the transverse process, you will have a very easy trajectory to go into the foramen. Right. I think I think the Shall, message here is very clear that uh, Shall, can I get in there? Amit, please. No, Abhijit, Abhijit. This is Abhijit. Abhijit, please tell me. Yeah. So uh, as orthopedic surgeons, we are all used to AP and lateral views. Uh, so if we start with the, as Neeraj said, if we start with the endoscopy way, which is about 11 centimeters from the midline, we always enter the transforaminal region. And it's very easy to give these injections in that manner. 
if you try to do the scottish dog way it is always difficult to find out the right location so myself i prefer the ap and lateral views which we are always used to see this uh, in a regular surgery so doing an ap lateral views and injecting in that technique is easier and re it's reproducible i think I'll, i'll i'll summarize all what has been said for the sake of delegates that injections have to if you see it has to start somewhere here 5 to 7 cm lateral to the midline that's where on the skin your tip of the needle is put in you have to aim for the scottish dog neck appearance here what dr amit was trying to highlight that you go medial to the nerve root we all know that the nerve root kisses the pedicle inferior half and your needle is directed that side also your needles have to be angulated in a proper manner so that your needle is going towards the disc remember that the l5 s1 disc is far more oblique than 4 5 3 4 is banked parallel to the surface and 2 3 and higher have have a further angulation so this is something that we all need to understand that the angulation of the needle from the surface of the skin has to be 5 to 7 cm laterally you start angle, angle it towards the disc and in both ap and lateral it is very important to see and try to reach the scottish neck appearance now the question here some one of the delegate was asking was uh, when you when you get your needle there you see it in the right place how do you ensure that your needle is in the cambens triangle area what dr amit is trying to mention is i'll just bring that cambens triangle level here any specific way how you ensure that your needle is reached here uh, abhijit yes yes how do we ensure that your needle has reached you were talking about some dye being injected somebody mentioned about stimulation Sure. Just a, yes, Vishal. Sure. Yes. Can you take yes. a question? Yes. So I I usually start about ten to eleven centimeters from the midline. I use the same approach I use for endoscopy. Uh, so I don't use the Scottish dog uh, appearance because it is very difficult to see the Scottish dog in obese patients and even in right. lot of Indian patients. So I feel that AP right. lateral is more easier. We are used to it. i start from uh, 10 to 11 cm from the midline i use the same needle i use for endoscopy so i reach the right. same right level and i inject right. the dye and inject the steroid so it is easily reproducible yeah. and you also practice your uh, endoscopy skills at the same time you know yeah i think i think we have dr ingal alikar to give us a word on that sir your needle in injecting localization technique we were wanting to have while you set up and share your slides we will want to hear uh, from you are, as well. are you able to see now yes we are, are able, able to see, see me now yes But we are not able to see your slides. Doctor Engel Alikar, can you hear us? So, Doctor Prabhu. Yeah. Uh, your technique, while while Doctor Engel Alikar is sharing his slides, can you tell us about your technique of needle localization technique, basically? yeah uh, as you said it it when we 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 keep our siam in oblique view only and then once you have reached the cambens triangle or superior to the nerve root under the pedicle then only then we go for a lateral and confirmation in lateral and ap and ultimately it turns out to be about uh, uh, 8 to 10 cm lateral to the midline that's for right the that's right. i think I, yeah that's very important one another question one another question is <clears throat> For S1 nerve root, for L5 S1 level, where there is the iliac crest on one side, the transverse yeah. process other side, and the lateral border of L5 on the other side. Vishal, sure. really narrow triangle. How do we navigate our needle, Doctor Engel Alikar? You are there. Can you answer that? Yeah. Uh, see, you can inject S1 root by going in the S1 foramina from posterior inferior side. You make the patient lie prone. as if you are going caudal epidural but instead of going in the sacral hiatus you go oblique actually i have slides further on but there little i think we will go with the slides sir we will all uh, go in mute mode again, and we'll go I with said, the slides uh, uh, can you yes we can go with the slides so you basically got to uh, position in such a way that your spinal forces are neutral now before that i would like to say something important which we miss while you are discussing uh, we always put the patient prone we don't put patient only the patient has to be prone position and very well stabilized 
The patients, because we are not going to use any other local anesthesia or anesthetic, these patients will wince with the pain. They might jump with the pain. When you go and touch the nerve root, they will jump again. And that is where the problems will come. Therefore, patient has to be completely stable as if he's sleeping prone with the head properly hanging. His legs, knees, thighs, his chest has to be completely stabilized. You manipulate your C arm in any which way you need. You learn to deliver the needle going end on actually, but don't keep the patient in any other position. Neither oblique, neither lateral, nothing. So, as, and as I said earlier, the point is the needle has to travel actually into the Oh, this is this is important that we we make that uh, circle using the, the handle target the point of area see it's it's easy to say both four fingers lateral three and a half inches lateral four inches quarter to five lateral then go 20 degree oblique on the table we find very very often this doesn't work like in lumbar spine screw all of us then don't really go for 10 degree, 15 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree. We go as per that particular patient in offer all said and Therefore, if we have this particular thing that you let the needle travel coaxial end on to the bony point that you have selected and then navigate the tip and then we confirm. I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that. Once we have positioned the patient, we have positioned the patient, we have I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. And um, can, can you see this needle? This is how the needle passes inside. It doesn't pass like this. I, I am at this point, which probably is three inches, three and a half inches, four inches laterally, but this is how I would enter and touch the various areas. See this needle? That needle is standing there end on, touching the part medial to the root or in the axilla of the root. I'm exactly there. Now I will confirm that in the lateral view, confirm that in APU. This is an area I really want to reach. And this is where my needle is right now. Because I made it go axial and not obliquely coming from left side, right side, top, below. And this always, later on, you check up on this. Then you confirm. Start injecting. Can you see that? See this further again? See the dye further? As you keep injecting, technically speaking... Can't see the uh, injection. There, there is a lag. There is a lag. What uh, Dr. Ingralikar is talking, and then there is a slide. Yes, yes. There is a lag. Okay. Now, this, these are anatomically speaking. This is where you want to go. Let, let me go back. This is where you want to go for lateral to the root. This is where you want to go medial to the root. Well, this is the route. I think this is you going to this sir. point. Yes. VTI, sir. VTI, sir. One second. So I think I would want okay. everyone to, all the delegates, please see how wonderfully the die is localized only locally. Because this is even if you see there is a line of nerve root that is getting spread across. This is something that is classical. However, in an intravascular spread, it will not be localized like this. There will be a distant spread of the dye 
telling you that your needle is localized inside a vessel and that is something that is very very important if you get your injection intravascular you can land up into a catastrophe and that is why using a dye is imperative it makes your procedure safe and when you inject a dye how should it look to ensure that you are not intravascular this is what dr engelalika slide is showing at you right now yeah, dr engelalika if you if you happen to be intravascular that you will not even be able to see the dye it will disappear hector vector in just within 2 seconds 5 seconds yes and Now, you, should, you should be wary of injecting lignocaine intravascular patient may have a sudden cardiac arrest in minutes in seconds you know if you inject to a, a lignocaine inter intravascular and that is why use of small acting uh, lignocaine use of uh, uh, without adrenaline use of a short acting lignocaine and ideally and always always impro imp imperatively xylocard imperatively always use it after a dye shows a non vascular spread only sir back Now, to you for 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 those people who are not used to the three dimensional understanding you are going here which is lateral to the root this is lateral to the root and this is medial to the root here so you are going to go and touch this as an end point then maneuver the needle medially you're going to go and touch this point and maneuver it medially these are the points above and below this is where you're going to target your needle and we do this without local anesthesia on because we don't want patient not to tell us if the nerve is being touched Oh, this is where I've reached this, and now I'm advancing it further. You can see the dye spreading at lots of places. Uh, when you want to get intradiscal, for various reasons. this is instead of going here you go in this area you touch this part medial to the facet skirt around it and get go straight into this and this is how you will be entering the disc but again as i said end on my method is an end on introduction so that i know exactly my tip will go at the end of the story uh talking about sacroiliac joint sacroiliac joint is an oblique joint the upper part is syndesmotic only lower part is synovial cavity you can't enter here you will pierce the syndesmosis with no space unless the damaged uh, degenerated joint but this is where you want to go and inject now not only you make it oblique 45 degrees 30 degrees 40 degrees you also tilt the pelvis up and down you tilt the pelvis up and down or till you see up so you are best able to see the thing and then inject that area if you look at the plane of si joint this is a plane of si joint this is the plane of your facet joint here and this is the same plane of the opposite si joint that's the plane of entering into foramen when you want once you go there you will find these are the in the lower part planes variable when you try to go to coccygeal you find this is for your coccygeal hiatus actually this is spina bifida in a developmental sense so this is your lateral tubercle what we call horns or corno uh in the female the thing is more curved in the male it is more straight this is how you will see in ap view this is you need to go in here what i do is i try to put my thumb there if i put my two fingers on top of this on the corner uh, so now uh, i know i have to go between those two fingers of mine ingalalika sir there is a small uh, small technical yes. glitch here 
there is a lag in your voice slide uh, we may want to correct it uh, by by make by coming to a slide holding there for few seconds and then starting talking again sir okay 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 can you see this slide now we are able to see sacro coccygeal block slide okay and your thumb placed on the uh, sacral hiatus that slide we are able to see right okay now. you are able to see that i put my thumb here feel that khadda in a very fatty person you may not be able to palpate it well but a majority of the patient by deep palpation you will be able to palpate that okay then i put my two fingers here i remove my thumb and try to introduce my needle inside now before that this is a needle we use to his needle it's a rounded shoulder so it doesn't get stuck up in the posterior lateral ligament continuation right up to that area generally it is 80 gauge or sometimes 20 gauge 20 gauge needle can bend slightly it can yield and take a contour of the sacral canal can you see that vishal could you see that no there's a lag there's a lag Yeah. Press the escape button, sir. Go out of the PowerPoint, and then you can transition transit your slides better. Is that better? Yes. Can you see that now? We can see the tip of the needle, sir. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Sir, your voice is clear. We would request you to uh, go away out of the PowerPoint. Out of the show because it is taking. There is a lag in transition of slides. Okay. okay. One sec. Okay. Can you see now? We would want you, you to go me? out of the, out of the, out of the PPT, sir. Out of the PPT. Please press the escape button. End the show. End this show. End the show of PPT. Can you see me now? Is there a lag now? Okay, carry on, sir. Carry on. I think carry on. Yeah, now, now better, sir. Then I think you you would rather run through the slides like that, yeah. Oh, there's still a lot of lag. <laughs> It is little heavy, sir. Maybe because of because of the yeah. number of slides is little heavy. Anyways, we can proceed, sir. We can proceed. We can proceed and keep going uh, for yeah. a little while. Okay. You see? Can you see and hear me simultaneously now? Yes. Please proceed. Okay. Now this is where I'll put my thumb. Then I'll go ahead further. Can you see the needle now? No, your your slides are not transiting, sir. I think you may want to restart it while we can have a small discussion around, sir. Yeah. Now okay. I think hopefully, hopefully your slides may transit now. Yeah. Can I go out of the meeting and come back? Will yes. I... Please, please do that, sir. While we can have a discussion huh? happening. Can meanwhile, I go sir. Out of... Yes. Okay, please, please do that, sir. Please do that, sir. So while we are while while we are uh, while we have Dr. Engelalika setting it up, can we have the panelists back, Dr. Priyank, uh, Dr. Priyank? and dr abhijit i'm there uh, dr abhijit what is the commonest indication in your practice like a patient with back pain you try this more or, or a patient with leg pain you try this more so hello vishal can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah so my commonest indication is radicular pain radicular or uh, unilateral claudication pain is my commonest indication uh huh so it is basically a radicular pain with a pivd yes or a unilateral claudication pain in a patient with stenosis predominantly and, and, they at have what pain. stage ah at what stage of radicular pain like a patient comes to you on day 1 with leg pain and your mri shows a disc would you try it on day 1 or at or two weeks three weeks you would wait with simple no, measures I would, and then i will try conservative management for about two to three weeks and if they fail conservative management for about three weeks then i would give them an option 
Okay, since it has not yeah. worked and there is significant compression of the nerve seen on the MRI, uh, right? Then I would we we should try this as an uh, treatment option. So discogenic radiculopathy is the commonest indication of a transforaminal root block injection. Doctor Prabhu, what is the other indication where you use these injection techniques? In in patients with radiculopathy in uh, spinal stenosis, we usually give uh, more of uh, with the borderline stenosis patient not willing for surgery. You can go ahead with a conservative line with the uh, 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 root blocks. Okay, so the and, number one indication and, is yeah, 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 yeah. It's coming back to discogenic pain where you have a prolapsed disc, first attack, SLR is positive, grossly positive. I would wait for a week. See how the SLR improves every uh, day, alternate day. See how the uh, SLR improves. And once we know that the SLR has started improving with your other NSAIDs, and then after a week, I would go ahead and give a, a transforaminal root block. Right. right. Dr. Sandeep, Sandeep, are you there? Sandeep Sonone? We, we heard about indication of transforaminal root block in acute radiculopathy. We heard about use of them in borderline stenosis. Patients either waiting for surgery or, or not fit for surgery or not willing for surgery, again, you can use it in borderline lumbar canal stenosis with not very significant compression also. Uh, Sandeep? Yes. Why yes Sandeep come, so, Sandeep, what is your uh, indication? Do you use it for back pain patients also, discogenic back pain patients also? Not really, but uh, if it is a multi-level stenosis where I'm not sure, like we have a significant stenosis at one level and the upper level is also symptomatic we are not very sure about it in multi level uh, stenosis definitely it's an indication for diagnosing the correct levels right right and and uh, any other indication like a failed back patient after 3 vishal, months 6 months vishal yes dr prabhu yes uh, in case your mri shows lot of synovial effusion in the facet joint and patient has only very bad uh, low back pain I would go ahead and give a, a, a facet block in these patients where there is no radiculopathy so, but a lot of back pain. arthropathy. Yeah. Facetal arthropathy also arthropathy. you would want to do a facet yeah. block? Facet block, yeah. Yes. So these are the commonest indications, mind you guys. Acute radiculopathy, not responding in early days to treatment. Uh, chronic uh, radicular symptoms in a patient with borderline stenosis. In a patient with failed back also. In a patient with facetal arthropathy. In a patient with only leg pain with degenerative listesis, you can try these. In a patient with severe facetal arthropathy, you can try. In patients with multiple level lumbar compressions as a diagnostic modality. In patients with more than one disc, where you use it as a diagnostic modality. In patients with sacroiliitis and sacroiliitis confirmed on MRI as the cause of back pain and buttock pain, non-resolving to simple treatment is something where you use SI joint injections. Uh, Dr. Prabhu, where do you use caudal injection? What is your indication for caudal epidural injection? Very little, very little nowadays because we have uh, seen that uh, giving an injection, caudal epidural, it usually flows out from the various S1, S2, S3 foramina and little amount of the drug would reach at L5, S1 and definitely nothing above L4, 5. So caudal epidural right. is out, out now. Dr. Neeraj, can you come over here? Uh, Neeraj, uh, for example, if a first block has been given in a patient with acute radiculopathy or for facetal arthropathy, after the first block, patient generally says for early 3-4 days that they are partially better. After 5th day, the patient says that my pain is only 30% better. How early can you repeat the second block? Priyank, Priyank can you take that question? How early would you like to repeat a second block? Six weeks, 12 weeks? So technically, re repeating the block as early as one week is also fine because it's not going to have any problem. The idea is that you are not going to gain anything by uh, repeating the block every week. So my take is up to three times a year, you can give block wherein uh, the patient is using it purely for a therapeutic purpose. Uh, wherein the patient requires surgery, but you are not able to do surgery. Whereas if a block fails within a month, right. means the patient is not going to do well with block and you need to go to the higher modality of treatment. So Dr. Prabhu, how early, yeah. how yeah. early would you repeat a block in a partially yeah. relieved patient? After, yeah, after my first injection and if the patient said, as you put, uh, put it, it is 30-40% better, I would repeat a second injection, but definitely not before one week. 
and if two injection some... yeah if yes two... i think message is very well taken for all of us a injection is bound to give a early relief however a second injection should ideally not be tried for minimum 3 to 4 weeks time and should not be tried for more than three injections a year uh, dr ingal ali sir how often uh, vishal 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 vishal, vishal. vishal. Yes, sir. vishal. dr prabhu dr prabhu yeah. sir yes yeah. dr prabhu if if, if two if two successive injections with eight days apart i have no benefit to the patient don't try the third injection he will never can say i am better so yes. not more dr. than two injections Yes, Doctor Ingal Ali, we can hear you. We would like to hear a comment from you. Yes. Uh, when you give an injection to these patients, what is your counselling like? How do you mentally, apart from telling them the procedural technique, apart from telling them about the problems one can encounter, uh, how do you counsel them about the expected outcome? How do you define that this is what you should expect out of my procedure? Okay. <laughs> Doctor Ingal Ali, sir. Now the first thing first is in the outdoor. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. sir. Yes, we can. The first hear. thing yes. is you got to tell them it is. Yeah, it is not a painkiller injection. The patient has a pain, and you have suggested injection. The patient's natural presumption is this is a injection for pain. so it's not a pain killer it's not an analgesic injection that is something most important you have to tell them it has been give it is being given to reduce the inflammation inside as the inflammation will start subsiding slowly you will get relief but if it works faster better the action will finally come up to 5 weeks 6 weeks also if after that if we feel it necessary we might repeat this injection and that should be okay okay dr engelika have you have you ever doctor. have you ever heard questions like these from patients where they ask you that doctor uh, what is the chance of this injection not working in your hands how do you deal with that yeah yeah i tell them so depending upon the there's not respond to all treatment and medication in the same way that depends upon how your body responds to it you will get a relief but you have as per my experience you have fairly good chance of getting response but don't expect post injection to be free from pain totally by tomorrow or day after tomorrow okay Once dr prabhu this, uh, yes 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 thank you dr engelika dr prabhu i'll get back to you on again on this How often do you see patients coming back to you after three weeks? Is up three hours, is up thick. Tha, but my pain is back again Can't and of same magnitude. Yeah, in in this case, I would again go back to my conservative line of treatment. Hold on, see how much is the SLR is positive, and if my clinical findings on day one and day two are same, or they are uh, third week is more, then I would straight away go ahead and say surgery. Right, Abhijit. abhijit yes. uh, how long do you wait after your first injection whether it has worked or not worked to offer a surgery for a radiculopathy for these patients i would wait for 4 to 6 weeks vishal uh, to see whether this really uh, gives a relief or not because initially sometimes and patients really might have some some patients have some increase in pain in couple of initially and then they respond to this uh, nerve block so i would wait for 4 weeks Right. No, but right. Vish Vishal, I have a question for Abhijit. Yes, Guru Raj. Guru Raj, please come up with a question. Um, I just see uh, Abhijit is saying he wants to wait for four to six weeks. Those, but these patients with severe pain, what do you do with them for four to six weeks? Then, no. See if the MRI is showing an X-ray disc and a large disc. Then obviously I will tell him, okay, we are trying this. Uh, let's wait for a week or two. But mostly we do this injections for patients who are borderline. You know. Uh, who are not the candidates for surgery? Uh, 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 you will be surprised to find that many patients who don't have a good relief immediately will have wonderful relief and a longer-lasting relief. So don't don't immediately try to change your strategy. As soon as you find that within a week's time, patient is not terribly better. I think right. the I message is. i think the message message given is very very pertinent please don't jump on to give a second injection very soon 
please don't jump on to surgery please believe in yourself please have strong belief in these injection modalities sometimes they work wonders yes the predictability of these injections is 50 50 sometimes they may work very very early sometimes they may start working only at a later date or a later part of time and at least 4 to 6 weeks of time should be given for these injections to be working or to decide whether they have stopped working and if they don't work maybe you can think about giving a second injection or if they have partially worked giving a second injection however if your second injection has not worked please do not try a third injection is the usual dictum here uh, i'll i'll ask one more question is uh, sir how what is the in this medical legal scenario uh, how do you counsel your patients about complications regarding these injections what is your consent looks like dr prabhu and then i'll ask dr ingal ali on this what is your consent looking like yeah for this we usually take usual consent but on in the opd we usually consent them that there are chances that you may not recover from this injection and as like any procedure there is a small incidence of getting infected and uh, uh, the nerve root can get compressed these are all uh, verbal consent verbal uh, uh, explanation to the uh, patient right right sir uh, dr ingal alikar any specific thing i mean do you take very specific consent now in regard to intravascular injection you are using drugs like xylocaine you are using no, particular no, no 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 special consent uh, we shall uh, i want yes. to ask a very public question uh, because of very very minimal incidences of vertebral artery injury are you fantastically scared of doing surgery around whatever artery you are not lots of people are not so yes. this this constantly being under fear that it will be intravascular it will go this this will happen don't keep that fear in your mind all the time cases can happen but that incidence is not terribly high except in cervical spine or upper cervical spine especially it does not happen right. so much in Number spine and the commonest patients we treat all are number right. spine case. So don't be afraid of this modality. Number one. Right. So right. Abhijit, have... Abhijit and yes. Sandeep, Abhijit. Yes. 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 Special. Abhijit and Sandeep, I have another question for you. What is your usual post procedure advice and medication that you give to these patients while you discharge them? Post procedure advice and medication. i give them one day of antibiotic uh, and i also give them uh, either an ultra set or, or or some gabapin uh, to supplement their injections for 10 days and call them right. for follow up after 10 days right sandeep 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 sir on anything else that you advise them apart from painkillers do you also use pregabalin or systemic steroid sometimes i think sandeep is not with us neeraj neeraj Priyan, can you hear me? So I never yes. ever give uh, I never ever give oral systemic steroid. If at all it has to be done, then it's injectable high dose steroid after admission under uh, vision. Right. But overall, if you are if you have an option of injectable steroid versus block versus oral steroid, in the order uh, blocks work the best, followed by injectable steroid. according to me oral steroid has got a iffy role right in right abhijit how do you know like you are already giving them tramadol you are giving them nsaids how do you know whether injection is working or your analgesics are working now whatever is working is working it should work shall can i take you take you slightly away from here yes Michelle? yes dr ingal can please this? can i lead the discussion slightly away from here yes okay. we have 10 more minutes to finish sir 10 yeah. minutes we more have we have okay. we have all the time been discussing the indications we have been discussing the therapeutics what we have not discussed in fact it was there in the lecture ppt is the diagnostic part of the story and we we use this for diagnostic a lot the diagnostic is if you suspect any patient that left sided l4 5 facet specifically and see how much pain relief patient has got if not go next go third go fourth but all that can be confused okay the the most important thing i have to do is to just prior to injecting before the patient is taken on the table i make patients do various actions 
and assume postures which give him pain. If he says standing on one leg, extension, rotation, left sided, gives me intense pain, I said, okay. I take him up, I inject that left L4-5 facet. After five minutes, I take him down. I make him do exactly those particular actions which produce pain just prior to injection. If he says, my pain is better, I know my diagnostic part of the story is on the line. If that's not the case, then I can yeah. go and inject the next. Sometimes I may have to defer the next diagnostic injection after two days. I may not be able to do it today itself. But basically, one has to critically evaluate. Then chance of your injection working thereafter, therapeutics, becomes excellent. Right, right. I think message very well taken here. We, we have been for what, last 90 minutes, we have been talking about the correct indication, choosing the right patient for injection techniques, the caution about injection technique. We must understand that the predictability of these injections is 50-50. We cannot promise 100% relief to our patients. All these patients will have their own chance and their way of reacting to these injections. There are known problems and complications that can happen and that's why pre-operative consent in these patients is very important. We spoke about the positioning, about how to position these patients to ensure that they don't develop problems. We also spoke about the importance of radiography, fluoroscopy intraoperatively. Always do these procedures inside the OT. Don't take them casually or lightly. They have to be done in most aseptic precautions. Uh, you have to ensure that you're choosing your patient well in terms of stopping the anticoagulants like Dr. Engel Alikar mentioned. We spoke about and we discussed about needle localization how to do it absolutely precisely in transforaminal and transfacetal and facetal blocks. We also spoke about localizing your needle in caudal injections. We spoke about the importance of intraoperative procedural uh, dye, use of dye to, to get the right uh, placement of our needle, to avoid how to avoid intraspinal, intradural injection of the drug, how to avoid intravascular injection of the drug. We spoke about and their problems, what can happen. We also spoke about the complications that can happen like early and transient motor weakness, which is for a very short lasting period. What kind of drug combo is the most effective one? We spoke about the problems that can happen with various drugs. And I'm sure we have all learned messages out of this. Post-procedural problems that can happen also have been discussed and post-procedural advice was just given across. Uh, one thing that we have so far not discussed is when not to do these procedures. And I'm sure from here, you all have already become at least 90% masters in injection techniques, but when not to do is something that we all must take home from here. Let me catch up on Dr. Abhijit. Abhijit, when will you not do these procedures uh, of any kind of injection techniques? No, if the patient uh, has obviously a large disc herniation and a neurological involvement like a partial foot drop, uh, and we know that the injection is not going to work, or there is a listhesis, spondylolisthesis grade two instability, then I explain the patient. Ki, these injections are an option, but it, their chances of it working are very minimal. And you have tried physical therapy, you have failed conservative management. So I would tell them that you would better go for surgery because uh, at some point in a month or two, they are anyways going to need a surgery for sure. So I, think cases, I, something, not... I think two, two points in one statement what Abhijit has made is one frank neuro deficit. Please try to refrain from giving a root block injection or any epidural or caudal injection severe compression avoid doing it and in a patient in whom you have not counseled well please don't give these injections you will only have an unhappy patient and your procedure will earn bad name dr guru when will you not do this procedure in your practice which patients strict contraindication yeah actually uh, partial foot drop especially when we do these injections mainly l45 s1 Partial foot drop is the one which we have to be we very careful. about neurology, Raghu. Uh, Guru, anything else? In, 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 uh, in, when, in, when do you have any uh, suspicion of infection? Especially when those infection. modic changes. Not frank infection. Suspicious of infection also. When you have these modic changes, yes. where you are suspecting there can be some infection. If you do injection, if it turns out to be an infection ultimately, then the blame will be on you. So it's right, always doctor. better... Con Always better confirm with your blood test, CRP yes. and ESR and total yes. count. If they are normal, then only do these injections. Otherwise, Amit Sharma has already added something more. Uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, avoid using it. 
patients on severe anticoagulants please avoid using it yes coagulopathy is avoid dr prabhu i'll pose a scenario to you please tell me when you would use it or not a patient with mild symptoms but very severe compression radiologically would you do a uh, injection for the fear of propagating neuro deficit in them or no uh, uh, without neuro, without neuro deficit i would definitely go ahead secondly if my mri shows that it is a ruptured sequestrated disc causing this problem i will definitely not give that injection because ruptured i don't want large the large sequestrated disc sequestrated please disc. don't do these procedures it is not recommended you may land you up could, you, you, you could with... aggravate right right dr ingal alikar when have you regretted giving these injections like are injection nahi diya hota to zyada better hota two case scenarios in your 50 years of life of practice two cases when you regretted giving spinal injections uh, only only when the os injection uh, that also i'm sorry to reveal but i it happened at sinus hospital uh, where the setup wise there is much to decide and one patient in one patient where it looked like uh, pid but it turned out to be a uh, neoplastic so that is where i thought i could have done little more homework and injected only afterwards of course the patient was better but because the pain was better my looking at it again and trying to diagnose or working something more on him was stopped right uh, sandeep sandeep let me catch you on this you are coming and going sandeep sonone uh, please can you tell me about your indications in patients with frank instability i mean of course you would not want to do it in patients with trauma neoplastic fractures pathological fractures like dr engelali ka mentioned pathological fractures ballooning of things osteoporotic fractures trauma but in patients with degenerative spondylolisthesis in patients with frank instability is there any role of these root blocks in your practice yeah so one of the things is that when we talk of instability we only talk of translational instability like grade 1 or grade 2 there's something which is called as axial instability also which is an indication where you see hypertrophied facets you know in which case the superior articular process impinges into the 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 foramen and causes root irritation so these are the cases which might not be actually we might not be uh, make a radiological diagnosis but by giving a root block injection we can very well uh, uh, uh get an assessment of the axial instability which probably could uh, help the patient for the time being you know right right very true i think message is very clear uh, before we part off one very very significant point i would like to bring forward in a case scenario which we all are going to see more often elderly patients 70 years plus or older 75 or older unfit for surgery degenerative scoliosis where you do not know the level of pain but patients actually have a crooked spine multi level compression and unilateral leg pain guru do you see patients like this degen scoliosis on x ray multi level yeah, compression yeah. on mri and unilateral or bilateral leg pain would you recommend injections in them and do you see a big potential of injection techniques being used in these patients for their benefit uh see definitely if you if you can delineate a dermatomal pattern in these patients actually the root block is really known in these patients hello yes we are hearing you yeah that's what so if you can delineate a dermatomal pattern in these patients the root block is really a boon in these patients so because if you want to do a limited decompression uh, or something mm -hmm. like that so the root block will definitely guide you as a diagnostic procedure also right ranjit ranjit uh, ranjit unnikrishnan can you can you hear us ranjit yeah yeah we shall tell you ranjit you have, you have a humongous work on degenerative scoliosis patients or crooked spine who have, who already have osteoporosis have mechanical instability multi level compressions and i am sure everybody among us will be seeing such elderly patients with increasing life expectancy we will be seeing more and more of such patients what is your take in these patients is there a fear of progressive osteoporosis which they already have uh, with the with the use of these more steroids coming in spine do you worry that these can uh, actually land you up into neurological deficit and you contraindicate uh, these into these patients or you would want to advocate more and more of this for doing more localized procedures so uh, vishal in this group of patients which you mentioned right now my role of uh, 
individual or a roadblock is generally to find the pain generator and rarely as a therapeutic procedure. I don't think that, uh, I don't have even know any evidence that they really increase the osteoporosis or they will cause deficit unless it is a technical problem. <laughs> Dr. Ingal Alikar. Dr. Ingal Alikar. Yes, Dr. Ingal Alikar. Two questions for you, which are already posed. One, are patients with diabetes poor candidates for root block or epidural block? And are patients with severe osteoporosis poor candidates for root blocks? Okay. Now, uh, diabetes, all, all diabetologists say, and a lot of infectious people say, that if the patients... Uh, Current blood sugar is well controlled. They can be good. They, they are candidates who can be given. Uh, somebody who had a bad diabetes two months ago does not mean that he can't be given today. If his, this week's levels are okay, you take all the precautions you can give him. There's another way of looking. Some people say that if HbA1c uh, give injection safely. But we generally prefer to have it well controlled and up to seven because ultimately you are introducing steroid inside. So small capac small potential of infection is always exaggerated here. Now talking about the, can I answer the second question? Yes, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis, no contraindication for injecting these because none of these injections are known to have a larger, long-lasting systemic effect, good enough to produce osteoporosis or increase osteoporosis. Now, coming back to the question about scoliosis, degenerative scoliosis, can I add something to that? Yes, please. Okay. Last comment and we'll then put a summary statement. Yeah. Uh, this, this patient, they have not only facet pain, but they have a painful area in the lateral margin of posterior lateral or lateral margin of the vertebra body. So these are the patients, if when you inject facet, go ahead further and do intradiscal injection. They will right. feel better because most of them, they have cavitations inside. They have empty discs. They sometimes even subluxate right. laterally. So these are the cases where you should go and inject the disc. They would have a relief. The second point about that is many of these people, they have iliocostal impingement. Right. The ribs dig into the pelvis. And the local soft tissues sometimes give pain. So in those are the patients where you could inject the local area. Right. Like you would have injected tennis elbow. Or you I, think, I think it's, it's a completely a different Pandora's box of trigger injections. Of the ribs. It's, it, it's, it's a completely different. different it's a completely different Pandora's box and I'm sure we'll have another full day session on uh, trigger injections and spot injections and cervical spine injections also. Uh, before we sum up, before we before we uh, come back to close this session, I'd like to give a summary statement and summarize this session as a whole for today. Uh, it's been a really wonderful session. I think spinal injections is something that everybody of us uh, wants to do or are already doing it. However, multiple of us have completely different way in, in vague and absence of uh, objective literature about this, there is always a my way, your way. But today what we have come up with is the right way of doing it. We have learned about the right indications of when to do acute radiculopathy, chronic back pains, facetal arthropathies, uh, borderline lumbar canal stenosis, degenerative scoliosis, more than one level disc, more than two level compressions, uh, mild to moderate instability patients. The, the role of them can be either in the form of diagnostic blocks versus therapeutic blocks. These blocks are wonderful, though they have a very poor predictability. However, there are enough randomized control trials, at least in patients with dyspogenic back pain and leg pain to show that they really work for long term and have good relief in terms of pain relief for these patients. Uh, yes, there are contraindications. We know that coagulopathies, frank infection are strict contraindications for giving uh, root block injections. In patients with uncontrolled diabetes, you surely need to get worried about in patients with pathological fractures, please get really wary about giving these injections. You can worsen it. Borderline injection, infections in the form of uh, modic changes also be wary about giving these uh, injection techniques. There are various injection techniques. You must be ready with them in your armamentarium. 
right from root block injections to facet block injections. We spoke about midline interlaminar epidural steroid injections and also caudal injections. All of these work in a different format for the same pathology. Uh, and of course, the technique for all of them are very different. The basics of technique is the right positioning, choosing the right patient, right localization of the needle under right imaging guidance. And of course, the most important part is giving the right dose of combination of drugs in, at the right place. Uh, try to always ensure with the help of dye that there is no intravascular and intradural injection. Otherwise, the catastrophe is sitting for you. Always do these procedures and in, in under CM guidance using a dye method in OT. Please don't take it casually. After a proper consent taken like a surgical procedure, we just discussed about it. Post-procedure advises, we all know that you got to take control of these patients in the ward itself for a couple of hours till they don't, they completely recover from the transient motor deficit, which is known to happen in these patients. Of course, antibiotics for a day or two helps. Control of diabetes is recommended post. Uh, recommendation for pain management post-procedure is, is a good idea to give them a uh, good relief. Also, it is very important to understand that these patients may develop only partial relief. However, do not jump into a second procedure uh, as early as six weeks after that. Uh, also remember, advising a surgery for as early as three months after the injection carries a higher chance of infection rates if you are doing an instrumented fusion in these patients. And that's why a surgery should be advised only after three months. If a second injection has to be repeated, should be done only after six weeks after the primary injection and not more than three injections a year are recommended. We all must really follow these rules if we really want to have uh, wonderful results with spinal injections. Uh, they, ha they have immense potential in coming future. We are all going to see more and more unfit patients and they have an immense role in pain management, not only in pre-operative patients, but also in post-operative patients with residual back pain and residual leg pain and also in failed back spine surgeries. And I'm sure together, if we vouch to choose our patients well, counsel them well, and perform this procedure as per the white paper issued by the panelists here, we'll all be having flying colors with this wonderful procedure. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all the panelists here, Dr. Priyank Patel, uh, who spared his time back to back, right from three o'clock from one webinar to another, he's been jumping around. Guru Raj, Ranjit Unnikrishnan, Sandeep, uh, Ranjit, Neeraj, Umesh, uh, and above all, Dr. Bharat Chobe, Dr. Prabhu, and Dr. Ingal Alikar, uh, thank you so much for sparing your time. I would like to thank and extend our gratitude from all the participants here for enlightening us on this wonderful topic. Thank you so much. We'll join up tomorrow at 4.45. Till then, goodbye. See you. Bye-bye, Vishal. <laughs>